Amen. 1 Corinthians 1, we'll look at verses 1 through 9. When I say the name um, Vincent Van Gogh, uh, what comes to your mind? Uh, probably immediately you think of, hopefully, you think of a world-renowned artist and painter, and perhaps one of the most recognized or favored uh, of all time. He's considered, Vincent Van Gogh is considered one of the pioneers of, of modern art. Uh, several of his works like The Starry Night or Sunflowers or The Bedroom have become iconic and referred to as masterpieces in the art world. And some of his paintings have achieved record pl- prices um, in the art market. One of the portrait of Dr. Uh, Getchett or uh, irises are among the most expensive paintings ever sold, ranging from uh, 50 to $80 million just for one piece of painting. And personally, he's, he's actually my favorite. I, I've had the privilege of seeing some of his work in person at the Smithsonian uh, several years ago. Here's a picture of me <laughs> and Van Gogh. It's, it's obvious why he's my favorite. Um, and this is the self-portrait of Vincent Van Gogh. That's Van Gogh and, and Ben Gogh together. Um, but many, if, if you don't know who Van Gogh is, um, his, his work didn't actually, w- wasn't recognized uh, much until after his death. Um, so while he was alive, many would not have guessed that he would have been com- become successful. Most, of, most would have marked his life as incredibly challenging. He failed at multiple jobs beco- before becoming an artist. He struggled with friendships. Even his closest friends were often in turmoil with him. Uh, he had constant issues in his physical health, his emotional and mental health. He struggled. E- even actually his, 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 some of his m- most famous work were painted in a mental asylum. He had multiple poor, he, he mul- made mul- multiple poor financial choices. And he was often broke. His younger brother actually had to support him. He tried at uh, at multiple times in in love and relationships, and all of those were unsuccessful. And there was speculation that he even ended his own life. And so it wasn't until after his death where his work was more discovered, and it led to eventual fame. And now, because of this, he's not primarily known for his struggles or failures. Rather, he's vastly more known for being a phenomenal and innovative artist. And he's either a failure or a success, depending how you look at it. And this is so true of so many things. And this is honestly the tension uh, that we need to consider as we look at the book uh, or the letter of 1 Corinthians. Because it's easy, as we read through this series Together, it's easy for us to see the failures that happen in this church. Honestly, there's going to be parts of it when we read it, we're going to think, uh, our tendency is going to think, what a train wreck of a church. Almost immediately, even before we leave chapter one, we're going to see the divisions that happen uh, in the church. The people are arguing about who their favorite pastor is. Uh, There's sexual morality that's happening that's being completely ignored that's happening in the church. You'll see people that are suing each other, believers, self-proclaiming believers uh, suing each other in the church. People aren't honoring their spouses in the church. There's a misuse of spiritual gifts in the church. People are competing over who can uh, speak speak in tongues the best or the loudest. There are people in that, that are people are interrupting uh, church services, but overemphasizing certain gifts over others. E- even simple things like communion in the church, like when they take the Lord's Supper, are getting hijacked. Some believe that people are getting drunk off the communion wine. <laughs> Some say that people are, are are allowing the poor to sit with the rich. Gender roles are confused in marriage and in the church. And one of the big theological problems that they're faced with that some are even denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ or whether or not it actually happened or at least minimizing its significance. This, all of these things are happening in the church of Corinth and I find it ironic even when I'm driving in eastern North Carolina and I might see uh, somewhere in the rural part of eastern North Carolina a Corinth Baptist. I'm always like, um, do they know what happened in Corinth, right? And all of this happened really within a short period of time. Paul started the church, and he was with them, and he faithfully served them and preached the gospel there for um, a year and a half. And 
he goes and plants other churches. And now uh, around two years after he leaves, this is when he learns that all of these problems are beginning to emerge. So it wasn't a slow descent. This is a quick descent. The, the, the church was like Jenga. It started quickly, but it started to fall almost as quickly as it built up. And so most would look at it and say, well, that's an utter failure. It started and it qu quickly began to collapse. And most of us would say, well, it's done. It just needs to close the doors. I mean, this kind of turnaround of um, people that have come together and they've come to know Christ, and there's probably about 60 of them who've come together and they've come to know Christ. Now they're all beginning to uh, decline spiritually and walk away from the truth of the gospel. And so most of us would say it's done and close the doors. But I want to tell you, this is not the God that we serve. Amen. That God does not see them that way. Rather, God sees them as his bride. And how does he see his bride? He cherishes and he loves his bride. And it's, it's really easy to look at the church and be frustrated, is it not? I, I'm, I'm talking about not just the capital C church, the church across our nation, the church uh, across the world, but also the the lowercase c church, the local church, I could even say integrity church. It's easy to look and see the problems. But how does God see the church? He sees it and he loves it. Not that he ignores the problems, but he loves it in a way that he wants to see it thrive. That he wants to see it faithful. And even in the broken places, he wants to see it restored. And here's why all of this matters this morning church because if you've been around the church for a while you've probably been frustrated with it and if you haven't been frustrated with it it's probably because you haven't been around it much all right and i have been frustrated with it and i do it for a living right i i have been i have often contributed to the frustration i've also been frustrated by other people's contributions as well and that's just real and so if you've been hurt by the church or burnt out or if you experienced grief or heartache from, from others or professing believers, I want to tell you, you are so very much not alone. I am with you, and there are many here too. And it could have been your past experiences with the church, or it could even be this church. There is no perfect church, but here's the thing. I want all of us this morning, including myself, to see the church in the way that God sees it. And it's definitely not perfect, but God is restoring it every day. And even in 2024, God is uh, purifying and restoring his people. And throughout this series, my hope is that God would give us a love for his church, his people, and his bride in the way that he loves it. That God doesn't see it as a failure. That he sees it as a beautiful painting that he's not done with. And so what would it mean for you and I to love the church in the way that God does? May that be us, Integrity Church. Amen? Now, I love the first nine verses of this book because it gives us some insight of how God sees the church despite its many failures. So I'm going to read the first nine verses of 1 Corinthians 1. It says, Paul, he's the writer, he's the author, he says, is called by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. And our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. He says, grace to you and peace from God and our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to the way he sees the body of Christ. I believe it's the way that God sees it. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given uh, you in Christ Jesus. That in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, 
Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, I want you to just know one small, amazing token here in the first nine verses. Jesus is mentioned in every single verse. And Jesus is mentioned in every single verse because this is what Paul is showing them. It's Jesus working in the church. And that's what God loves, that Jesus is working um, in the church. And Paul is writing this as a letter. Yes, we do call it a book, but as a physical letter that he wrote to the church of Corinth. He was with them for a year and a half, and then now two years later, he hears of all these problems, and he's writing to them, and this would have been read even aloud in a public setting of 50 or 60 or so people that would have comprised the church of Corinth. That would have been read out loud. And this was probably not the first letter that Paul wrote to the church of Corinth. This is the one that we have recorded. And we can know this based on chapter 5. In chapter 5, Paul says, in my previous letter. He's, he refers to another time uh, that he wrote to them. And even the way that the, the book is designed, and the first six chapters are, are designed to talk about this lady named Chloe, who's a believer in the, in, in the church, and she was a significant part of the church's growth in its early uh, stages. You'll see all this in Acts chapter um, 18. And so Chloe's household is it's a wealthy woman who loved the Lord, a businesswoman who uh, maybe hired people that worked in the church, and so people that were comprised of her household. The first six chapters are to her and her household, and then chapter seven begins, he says, now I'm writing to you about the things that you've brought to my attention in your letters. So there's a correspondence that's happening between Paul and the church of Corinth of things that are happening. They're writing to him He's writing back to, to them. And so we have this letter, 1 Corinthians. We don't know how many happened before, but we have this letter to give us a little insight on how God would see the church and how Paul urges them to walk in step uh, with the gospel, to love one another and ultimately to love Christ. And so I want you to see this. Paul is writing this. He's, there's frustrations. There's going to be things that he's frustrated about yet Paul still, in the first nine verses, um, gives them this incredible amount of grace. And in this, he's going to show us a little bit of what he's hoping for in the church. He says in verse 1, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ and our brother Sosthenes. Now, Sosthenes was a guy who uh, traveled with Paul. He may have been the one who uh, probably the same Sosthenes that is in Acts 18 when the church of Corinth was began, and he's now the new leader of the, the synagogue. He took the place of a guy named Crispus, and so he is a, a new convert that happened as a result of Paul planting the gospel, and he may have actually written, like physically lit, written this letter to the church of Corinth. If Paul would have recounted and say, I want you to write this letter to them, he would have maybe even written it. And so Paul is saying, hey, remember Sosthenes. He's a guy that we saw come to faith in Christ, and he's with, he's with me. He's a testimony of the work that God has already done and is doing um, in Corinth. And so this letter starts off, it's it's, it's pretty encouraging, and although there's many problems, it's almost that Paul wants them to know how God still sees them. And you even see it in the very first line of chapter 2. He says, to the church of God that is in Corinth. He says, so this is written very differently than how Paul opens up all of his other letters. Let me just show you how he opens up. Uh, some of his letters, you see how does he talk to the Romans. He says, to those in Rome who are loved by God. That's how he talk, talks to the Romans in his opening lines. In his opening lines, to the church of Galatia. He says, to the churches of Galatia. To the Ephesians. To the saints who are in Ephesus. To the uh, Philippians. To the saints in Jesus Christ who are at Philippi. To the Colossians. To the saints and the faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, to the Thessalonians. He says, to the church of the Thessalonians. So everything's the church of the Thessalonians, the church of the uh, Ephesians, the, the saints who are in Ephesus, whatever you'd have it. He says that over and over again. But what does he say to the Corinthians? He says, to the church of God that is in Corinth. That's different, right? And it's different because it's actually on purpose, that he says it this way. And here's why. He says, because he wants to make sure 
they don't miss whose church it is. Are you tracking? He says, you are the church of God that just happens to be in Corinth, right? So he wants to make sure there's nothing there that your pride gets in the way. So this is God's church, and it's in Corinth. And in the second part, he says, he says, to those who are sanctified in Jesus Christ, called to be saints together, all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Once again, not a normal opening for Paul. So not only does he say you're the church of God that's in Corinth, but he says, um, he explains to, uh, he explains what a saint is. Now most letters, like you have, we just read it in Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians, Paul writes to the saints, but not this time. Instead, to the Corinthians, he reminds them, he doesn't say to the saints, but he actually reminds them and honestly spells out what a saint is. Is. And what is a saint, you might ask? Well, if you grew up in a Catholic tradition, you would hear this as someone who is revered. If you didn't grow up in a Catholic tradition, you might think the, the saints are a team that just can't make the playoffs. But that's the Cowboys. Um, Paul defines the saints for us. He says, I had to do it. That he says, the saints is those sanctified in Jesus Christ. And then he also says, set apart. They're sanctified in Jesus Christ, and they are set apart. That's what a saint is. He's saying, you are not only God's church in Corinth, but because of Christ and his sacrificial death on the cross, you are set apart, meaning you are different than all of Corinth. You were bought with the blood of Christ, and he is making you different. And the big problem was the Corinthian church was starting to look more like Corinthian culture more than they did men and women who were bought and transformed by the blood of Christ. Now, Corinth was a, a sick place that needed a gospel witness. Uh, Corinth was known for the worship of, of many gods. It can, contained a number of pagan temples, including large ones that we, we would even all hear about, Apollo and Aphrodite. The, the worship of these gods were so ingrained in, in the culture of Corinth that it became a part of uh, governmental affairs and many cultural outlets and festivals. And, and it consequently, uh, the worship of many gods became a part of everyday life. Aphrodite is the ancient Greek goddess of sexuality and love and beauty. And so in, the, in, in Corinth, sexual immorality was rampant. Uh, prostitution was normal and not hidden. And I could go on about the darkness of Corinth, but just know that it's wicked. And it's one of those places that you could walk into and almost feel the darkness. Have you ever been to a place like that or a city like that and you just almost could feel the spiritual deadness and the brokenness just by walking down the streets. I've experienced that uh, multiple times in my life. I remember uh, the time where I went to uh, Bangkok, Thailand. And there you could walk on the streets and you could see literally people worshiping uh, different uh, false gods on the street. You'd see drugs and you'd see prostitution and sex trafficking. And here that those things happen, yes, in our country, but there it's just out in the open and you can you can just feel the, the darkness. You could see the brokenness. Uh, some experts say that in Bangkok there's uh, uh, 600,000 victims of human trafficking, and most happen right there in uh, Bangkok. Or that happens in Thailand, but most ha you could see it in Bangkok. And I've never felt so sick. Oh, man, just walking down the street, and I can imagine Corinth to be similar. And Bangkok, like Corinth, was a port city. Uh, there are many tra trades and travelers and cultures and a place that desperately needs Jesus. And the problem with the church of Corinth, they forgot this. Remember, they are the only church in Corinth. And they forgot who they were. Rather than being like Jesus, they started to act more like Corinth. And you might say, well, the problem was they were just in a, in a city, though. It was just too difficult for them to live. Friends, the problem was not that they were in a city. The problem was the city was in them. 
Gordon Fee says too much, he's a commentator, he says too much of Corinth was in the church of Corinth. And I think this is a great test for us even today. Who do we echo? Do we echo culture or do we echo Jesus? Who do your words and who do your actions sound like? Do they sound like what political party that you're from? Do you, does your words sound more like Anderson Cooper or Tucker Carlson or Jesus? Do you sound more like Joe Rogan or Oprah or Jesus? Do you sound more like Biden or Trump or Jesus? What do people get from you when you're there in your presence? Do they get the presence of culture that they already experience? Or do they get the presence of Jesus that is in you? How about the, your view of the world? Is it informed by Jesus? Is it informed by Jesus' uh, word? Is your view of money impacted by culture? Or is it, is it impacted by God's word? Is your view of sex or sexuality impacted or informed by culture? Or is it informed or impacted by God's word? Is your view of power impacted by culture, or is it informed, impacted by God's word? Friends, I want to tell you, these things matter to Jesus. And Paul would say the church should be set apart. It should not look just like the culture. Not set apart from culture like we don't go see movies, or we only listen to Christian music, or we should bunker down and uh, withdraw. That's not what set apart means. It's set apart from culture. It means it's set apart in the culture that we live in Greenville we live in Winterville but there should be something about the way that we see the world that's different and there should be something about the way we carry ourselves that is different and so how is Christ or how is Paul rather going to challenge the Corinthians to do this look at what he says verse 3 grace to you and peace from God our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of Christ God that was given you in Christ Jesus. What is Paul doing here? He's reminding them of who they really are in Christ. Paul is remembering the 18 months that he spent with them and what he saw Jesus do in them. And friends, I want you to know how powerful this is. I love Paul's approach here because honestly, a great deal of 1 Corinthians is Paul is going to lay the hammer down. Like he's going to say some really hard things, harder than any other place that he's ever spoken to. He speaks to the Corinthians. But here he's, you see his kindness and this is a beautiful way to draw someone in when you have the freedom to challenge them it begins with the kindness and grace and the mercy of God and I love this because John in first John chapter 1 verse 14 it says that Jesus came full of grace and truth in other words Jesus uh, displays both of these things perfectly all the time grace and truth all the time and I want to tell you that that should be our goal as well and it's not ironic that it begins first with grace and then truth. And this is how Paul is communicating to them, that he wants them to see the grace of God. And by doing so, he celebrates the growth that he sees in them. And church, I don't think this should just come when we're going to say something hard to someone. I believe we should tell our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ what we see Jesus doing in their lives because that is what we need in order to grow and to mature do you have people in your life that celebrate the growth of Jesus in your life I remember a few months back um our one of our partners that we celebrated or, or we supported um in our Christmas offering hope is alive hope is alive is an addiction recovery ministry here in Greenville and I got to go on one of their Sunday evenings where they do a devotion and part of the things that they began to, to build in their culture is before we jump in, they celebrate. And they celebrate their sobriety. Hey, how many, this person's been two months sober. This person's been two years sober. And they all cheer. And then there's another part of it before they jump into God's word that they call brag on a bro. And I love it. And they bang on a table. And when somebody stands up, they want to tell somebody in the group what they saw in them. What they saw in them it, from something as simple as, hey, thank you for washing the dishes. Or I thought it was awesome that you called your family. I really appreciate that you paid for gas. I really appreciate 
that you um, encouraged me the other day, and it meant so much to me. And the person, when they get the encouragement, they're supposed to stand up and receive it, and they walk and they hug each other. And I, and I remember thinking, man, I bet that was so powerful in their recovery. I was thinking to myself as I left, man, what if believers just did that? Like, what if we just said, hey, I want to tell you what I see Jesus doing in your life. Man, I believe that could open up believers so much we would feel freedom to confess sin when it's hard, that we wouldn't feel like we have to hide, that we would feel like I'm known and seen and loved, and I trust these believers, I trust this brother, I trust this sister in Christ. And so I just want to tell you, friend, if, if you see someone growing in Christ, tell them, right? If it's the next time you meet it, community group or discipleship group, if you just need to tell them in the lobby today, hey, before you leave, I want to tell you, here's a way that I have seen you growing in Christ, in, growing in Christ. or just send them a letter or write them a, a text. I want to encourage you, believer, tell your brothers and sisters how you see them growing in Christ. It's powerful. This is what Paul's doing. Oswald Chambers wrote an incredible um, little devotional called My, Uppos My Utmost for His Highest. I used to read it in high school, and he says, an encouragement a day keeps failure at bay. I love that. An encouragement a day keeps failure at bay. Dare to encourage someone to be pure and complete success in his or her part of life. This is what Paul is doing here. He wants it to be no mistake that he's for them, but moreover, he wants them to know that Jesus is for them. Look at what else he says in verse 5. He says, that in every way you are enriched in, in him, in all speech, in all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in spiritual gifts as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. The church of Corinth was known for its variety of gifts, and Paul says, I've seen that in you. I've seen you grow in, in speech and knowledge. Later, you'll see Paul commend them for being a, a generous church. They uh, supported Paul's ministry. They supported other churches. And Paul says, you are not lacking in gifts. And what we, we learn about spiritual gifts, even in the Bible, is one of the most prominent places is in 1 Corinthians. They were known for how gifted they were and incredibly talented they were. And they had a presence in Corinth, this small group of believers that was known, and Paul just says, I want to tell you that because I don't want it to be wasted. And here's why that's important. Second part of seven. He says, so that you, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is the picture that Paul gives them? It's a picture of a church that will not be known at, for its failures, but rather a church that is ready for Christ. And this is another part of sanctification when we think about what it means to be sanctified what does it mean for us to be saints sanctification yes it means to be set apart to be different that the chain that that's the changed life of a believer but here's the other part of sanctification you and i because of christ if jesus has died in your place and you've surrendered your life to christ and his lordship friends i want to tell you you are going to grow and mature in Christ because that is what the Spirit does. And every believer in Jesus, there's two things that are true. One, you are justified, meaning Jesus died in your place. And so when God looks at you, he says that you are made right. You are positionally made right before God. Some people say that justified, a way to remember that is just as if I've never Sinned. And it doesn't mean that your, the consequences of your sin will, will go away, but you are positionally made right. When God looks at you, he sees the finished work of Christ. But there's another part of that's true if you're a believer. Not only are you justified, but you are being sanctified, even right now, that you were set apart and you were different. And this also means that the Holy Spirit of God is constantly working in your life. I've heard it said that you are an incurable God lover if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. That your love for God will keep 
growing. And yes, you will have peaks and you will have valleys and you will have rough times and seasons of doubt, but God will use all of it to make you more like Jesus. And that's a huge part of sanctification, that he's not done with you. And he'll never be done with you until you see him. Paul says it this way in Philippians 1, 6. He says, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it into completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Meaning, yeah, you might stray, but if you are a believer, you're not going to stray far. If you're a believer, the Holy Spirit is constantly stirring and moving in your heart, and he's making you new. Church, do you realize that the, you are invincible in the sense that the Holy Spirit is not going to stray, uh, let, let you stray far from Jesus? That he's going to finish what he started in you. And so this is the confidence that Paul has in the church of Corinth. Yes, there's some failures there, but listen, I'm trusting. And I've already seen the Spirit's work in your life, and I'm seeing that the Spirit can draw you into better fellowship with him. The Spirit's going to draw out um, repentance in your life. And friends, if you're here this morning and Perhaps you don't see that change. Perhaps you're, you're allowing yourself to go too far and you don't feel the Spirit's move in my heart. I invite you to uh, maybe perhaps you've never really truly trusted in Christ in the gospel because that's what the Spirit produces. You're justified, you're made right, but you're sanctified. And every believer has both of those things. You are being sanctified right now. So why is Paul not discouraged in this church? Because he trusts that ch the church is being sanctified even right now and there's something else that he has confidence in in this verse 9 he says god is faithful by whom you were called into a fellowship of his son jesus christ our lord and so what else does have paul have confidence in it's the spirit's work in the believer's life yes but it's also the fellowship of his son meaning the church meaning god's plan for the church you can see it in verse 2. He says that the church was called to be the saints together with all who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just the church of Corinth, but it's the church in every place. That Paul sees the work of Jesus of all the churches who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every church that makes much of Jesus, Paul says God will be faithful to them. And this is true even of our country that about 4,500 churches close each year in our country, and only about 3,000 new churches start in our country. And this is an, a statistic that happened actually before the pandemic. And it may seem that things are behind, but even throughout the world, I want to tell you, God is working and moving, and he's purifying his church even right now. And one of the statements that we say here at Integrity often is the church is God's plan A. How would the church, how would God uh, bring a light into the world and push back the darkness? It would be through his bride, the church. And that's what Paul has confidence in. I love the words of Jesus in, in Matthew 16. He says, I tell you, verse 18, I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. So what does this mean? That, 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 that means the church is constantly pushing back darkness. And one of the little insights that we see, it's the gates of hell that will not prevail. You don't win wars with gates. You're, you're not on the offense if you have gates. The gates of hell be, are, are there because, th th that's the imagery that we have, because the gospel through God's church is pushing back the darkness. The gospel of Jesus is pushing back the darkness, and this will continue to happen, as Paul says, until the day of Christ, meaning the day that Jesus returns for his bride. Jesus is working and using his church to push back the darkness. That's the confidence that Paul has. This is why Paul could stand with such confidence to encourage these believers. You're set apart. You're sanctified. And God is going to keep being faithful to his people because that's what he said would happen. So, friends, I want you today to be encouraged at what Jesus is doing in his church. Are there failures? Of course there are failures. Because Christ hasn't returned yet. And there will always be. But, friends, let us not lose heart. Jesus will finish what he started. That's a promise. And, so friends, if you want to be negative about the church, it's easy to find. It's easy to find. If you, want to, if you already made up your mind you're going to be negative, you'll find things to be negative about. Hey, if you got a negative list, 
You bring it to me. I probably have the same negative list that you have. But I want to tell you, if you want to be encouraged in the gospel, I want to tell you to look for grace in Jesus' church. And I promise you, just as much as you find negative things, you will find grace if you're looking for it. If you're looking for negative things, you'll find it. That's why negative people hang out with other negative people all the time. You're like, my friends are negative. Maybe we should look at your heart, right? Negative people will find negative people. Negative people who want to find negative things about Jesus' church will find it. But if you want to find grace in what Christ is doing, I promise you, you will find that as well. And this is what Paul is hoping to find. So what are the changes right now? If you're thinking about, man, what about, how do I grace? How do I find grace? What are, what are the changes that you're seeing in the lives of your brothers and sisters around you? I mean, what could you celebrate with them? Is there grace that you can share even today with your brothers and sisters in Christ? What, what's coming to your mind right now? Who's coming to your mind right now? See, man, I have not told this person this, this, this growth of Christ that I've seen in their life. And maybe we could just go and I could tell them and we could celebrate that together. Friend, if you look for it, you will find it because that is what the Spirit is doing in his church. Would you see the church that God sees it? And even in our local expression called Integrity Church today, I want to tell you, this is the words of Paul as he says, you are the, the church of God that is in Corinth. Integrity Church, you are the church of God that is in Greenville or Winterville. Integrity Church, I want to say what Paul, what Paul says to Corinth, you're also not lacking in gifts. This is a church that is a gifted church, Integrity. So it, do you have, what gifts have you been given? Is there a talent that you've been given? Is there a treasure that you've been given? Is there a skill that you've been given? I want to remind you who gave it to you. Yes, it, you may have paid for your own education, and somebody else may have paid for your own education, but it's really his. And it's used for his bride, his church. Yeah, you might have money because you've worked hard, or maybe someone else did. Either way, it's the Lord's money. It's for his bride. It's for his church it's for his kingdom yeah you might have time but it's the lord's time it's for his bride it's for his church it's for his kingdom so i want to invite you you're not lacking in gifts so may we use it for his kingdom and it's easy to look across our country and see the failures of evangelicalism as we know it it's easy to make fun of christian culture it's easy to sit on the sidelines and judge the church by what it should be doing. And we've probably all done it. I'm a pastor. I do it myself. But can I tell you, that's just not how God sees his bride. And may we see his bride in the way that he sees it. And may, we, may that lead us to be a people who are set apart in Winterville and Greenville and wherever the Lord may have us. We are set apart, church, not just as a corporate body, but you as a believer in Jesus Christ. You are set apart, and you're called to be a part of his kingdom, his body, his bride, the church. May that be us. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for calling us to yourself. Thank you for the truth of the gospel that you have set us apart and that you've called us and you've justified us and you've made us right. But not only that, but you are right now. You are sanctifying us right now. And God, I, I trust that, Lord, that you're doing that in your world. You're doing that in our country. You're doing that in our city. And you're doing that even right now in our church. And so, God, I pray that we would feel the responsibility of that, not in a way of legalism or, God, we owe it to God in some legalistic way, but rather as this privilege that we get to be a part of a family of believers. And so I pray that we would encourage one another and we would build each other up in love, that we would be for one another as believers, that we would express that, the truth of the gospel that we see in, in others' lives. God, I pray that you would help us, Lord, as we can often be jaded can often respond out of our hurts or our angst. But Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to just have a posture of your church globally and locally that you would have. 
that you see the, the work that is still yet to be done, that you see the painting that is still becoming more and more beautiful. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to, Lord, just have that posture and have that heart and, and Lord, maybe we st- take steps to be towards what you are about in our church. And God, I pray for those in this room who've never surrendered to you and trusted you as Savior. I pray that they would surrender to you even right now. I pray for those who are listening online that maybe just stumbled upon this, but Lord, just need a, a message of, of gospel, and I pray that they would see Christ as enough for them, for their salvation and for their joy. In Jesus' name, amen.